I'd like to thank um, Bishop Pivarunas um, and the fathers and the good sisters and all of you for uh, the invitation. They've been after me for a few years to do this and honestly I have avoided the subject altogether uh, these many years because it is so controversial. But my confessor said, Father, you should invite our Lord to give you a cross. <laughs> and therefore, um, I have taken this as one of those things that in my life I need to speak of. I knew the Archbishop when I was quite young. He came to us from France where he was living um, for some years and doing some work. I didn't know much of him, but the story that I tell you is a story of my life, it is a story of his life, and it has become the story of your life in this knowledge of the Archbishop and the sharing of his sacramental life, which he very deliberately took up as Christ came for one purpose alone, that he might offer his life on the cross. And the following of Christ is always this, that you would take up your life and follow after him. And therefore, this following, um, he was not averse to, and he took it up. For myself, I entered religion um, Quite to my surprise, I would never have thought I would enter religion in my youth. I expected to become a lawyer and live in the world with a family and uh, probably very close to home. But God has his own ways and plucked me out of the world very, very rapidly and sent me off to college and introduced me to the Franciscan order when I was 19 years old. By the time I was 20, I turned 20 in a friary. So I was at the university about one year. And when I went off to the, become a friar, uh, one of the interesting things is, uh, as I entered there, Father said, what would your name be in religion? And I said, whatever you choose, Father, is quite fine with me. And then I bowed my head and I said, oh Lord, please don't let them call me Francis. <laughs> And the father said, therefore your name will be Francis. <laughs> Ever since then I've known that God has a very wonderful and interesting sense of humor. So I think that um, we have to bear that in mind in all those things that come upon our life because he is a very good father, a very tender father, and he wishes to draw from us much good if we will make ourselves simply available to him. I learned much of this from the Archbishop himself. He, um, when I first learned of him, I was in the friary studying uh, my first year of philosophy. And uh, as the first member of the household, um, I naturally ended up with more responsibilities than some of the others in the household and got to share in some of the news perhaps more often than others as they were in the novitiate or are uh, involved in other works. So we learned that the Archbishop was, had ordained two men in Toulon, France, and uh, someone made a joke about it, and I thought, well, that's not a very good joke, you know, that uh, he's too long and he's too loose, and too loose. And, um, and I thought, that's not really a good joke. He must, a bishop to act, must act very seriously. And therefore, there must be something to it, because to act outside of the church is a great crucifix, crucifixion. It is a great danger in all the sacramental acts that you take. And I would, was to learn of the archbishop that his very motto was Miles Christi, soldier of Christ, as our um, minor seminarians could tell us very proudly. He is a soldier of Christ, and the soldier knows what his commands are and what he is about and sets on the road to doing the work of the commander. 
And so there must be something about the archbishop that set him on this course. And that was something that we would, we would learn. The archbishop consecrated these two men, bishops Carmona and Zamora, in a quiet celebration, um, very minimalist celebration in his apartment in Toulon, France. He was criticized for this. In fact, on one occasion, I was approached by a member of a certain organization that said, oh yes, he was consecrated. He consecrated at night. In fact, this was on uh, Pius X website. And so, and this is many years after the event, I wrote to the author and I said, dear father, I need to know why it is unlawful to consecrate a man at night because our Lord himself made bishops and consecrated the first mass. It was nighttime. And every year for Easter, I offer mass at nighttime. So if there's something wrong with confecting sacraments at night, please, Father, would you please enlighten me? But the effort was about throughout the world to blacken the name of all the actions of Archbishop No Ding Tuk, all the choices that he made. It was a very difficult, uh, definite effort to obscure Catholic teaching and doctrine. And one of the things we know about anger is that anger always seeks to obscure the facts and will attack the object of the anger by all kinds of human, what we call in philosophy, ad hominem arguments. And this was obviously an ad hominem. You can't do it at night or there's something suspicious about the nighttime. And so I knew that there was something very profound about the archbishop, and the choices that he made had to be founded on something very, very solid indeed, for to take this step was serious. So to understand him, we have to know something about his background, and to appreciate indeed who the archbishop was. He was born on October 6, um, 1890, actually seven. Um, this is very interesting because it is only seven days after the death of St. Teresa of Lisieux. Seven days. God took one saint away and sent to this world a man who had become Archbishop of Hue. It is very important to know about Archbishop and this connection to St. Teresa because as he grew up, the fame of St. Teresa would spread throughout the world and particularly in the trajectory of the life of the archbishop, she would return over and over and over again. The beginning of this century was a century, one can almost say, of the little flower. Her miracles were prolific. The devotion to her was known universally. The archbishop himself would go off to France and study, and his ordination would be on uh, 19, in 1925, shortly after the very elevation of St. Teresa of Lisieux to sanctity. So the whole world would be abuzz with the life of St. Teresa of Lisieux. And this, she, he would have been in France at the time. He would have been studying and getting his doctorate at the time. A man who in two years received three doctorates. Now you tell me who in this country can get three doctorates in two years in Rome and be at the top of your class in all three doctorates. This is not a man of simplicity or stupidity. This is a man of great understanding and knowledge and intelligence. His love for St. Teresa was not simply because there were flowers that showered down into his life, but because he had a knowledge and she had a knowledge. St. Teresa of Lisieux um, I'm sorry, I should have passed one further. In her desire for martyrdom, spoke of it over and over again. Her love for martyrdom, her desire for martyrdom, her desire to give herself, her desire to go where? Where did she desire to go to? It was Vietnam. Did you know that? Her desire was to preach the gospel to pray for the souls in Vietnam. But her sickness, her sickness in the lungs, 
made it una her unable to travel. She fell in love at a very young age with Theophane Venard. Theophane Venard was a missionary, a French missionary priest from Paris. He would have studied in the same areas where Saint, uh, where uh, Archbishop No studied in France. The papers and the life of Theophane Venard were being published at the time of his youth and during his lifetime. And one of the things I could admonish every cleric here is to read the personal remembrances, the personal writings of Theophane Venard, which have been republished, and I think I have a slide of that publication. Theophane Venard gave up his life in Vietnam after completing his studies in France. His health held him back. He finally made it to France in the early part of 1850s. He traveled into France, uh, into uh, Vietnam, and finally, after one year abroad, entered into uh, to Vietnam and began his work. His bishop was very taken with him, but found that his health was weak. And in 1858, 1859, his, his health was so poor that he spent one year in retirement, recovering his health. And during this time, he made the dedication of himself under the hand of um, St. Louis de Montfort, Guignon de Montfort. He made the consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary, which should especially touch your hearts. He was being prepared to make an offering of himself. Because just after this consecration, after this consecration of himself to the Blessed Virgin Mary, a new persecution was to come upon Vietnam. And in that land of much blood, he would witness with his faith, with his own blood, to the faith. But not before he had written something in his biography, something which the Archbishop would have known about and which the world doesn't speak very much about. His bishop, during this persecution, was on the Mekong River, came up the Mekong River, came to the place, the seminary, where the priests were being prepared. Knowing that the persecution was coming, he came to the seminary, he came into the seminary, and in a matter of 15 minutes, he ordained his clergy. 15 minutes. He came in, he told them what we were about, he would do the minimum ceremony, he would lay his hand on all the native clergy. He would make his departure down the river immediately, leaving behind these men, these native clergy, who within weeks would be dead. Within weeks. But he would not do that before he had given to his flock the means by which they could confess their sins, go to Mass, receive absolution, have counsel, resign and prepare their marriages, correct their marriages, receive additional candidates who have been praying for the grace of baptism. He would be a pastor to his flock, no matter what would become, because the priest is called to be an Alta Christus, just as the bishop is in wearing his black to wear that red as a sign not only of the Holy Ghost, but of the blood which he is to be prepared to shed. These things Theophane Venard witnessed to in his, in his biography, his little writings. He was captured and went down the river. I'm sorry, he went down the river. The, the bishop went down the river. Theophane Venard was captured in 1861 in um, November. And he spent the end of November, December, uh, January writing these little pieces to his bishop, posting him to uh, posting him to the bishop, so that his bishop and his father, who those two people who were he was permitted to write to, could know something of his life. He was kept in a cage that was two meters long, one meter wide, one meter high. 
he was exposed for ridicule. And this time, he made an offering himself. He suffered greatly because his weak lung condition did not get better in such wonderful conditions. But he wrote to his father these wonderful words as he knew what was coming to himself. For the, the pagans required of him that he should come out of the cage, a crucifix should be put on the ground, and he was to step and crush the crucifix. And if he were not to do this, his life was forfeit. He would refuse this, as so many of his brothers would refuse it. He write, wrote to his father, a slight saber cut will separate my head from my body. Like the spring flower which the master of the garden gathers for pleasure. We are all flowers planted on the earth, which God plucks in his own good time, some a little sooner, some a little later. Father and son, may we meet in paradise. I, poor little moth, go first. Adieu, which means goodbye. These words and the shedding of that life of Theophane Venard was the reason why the little flower took the title Little Flower. Because she would imitate Theophane Venard by the offering of her life to God the Father, little by little, in acts of love, day by day. This is the beginning of the vocation of the little flower, the inspiration of her life. And so we see in him, the Archbishop, someone who had a vision, who was already seasoned, who had already been nurtured to a life of oblation, a preparation, of purposefulness, of seeing the will of the Father and trusting God the Father that he will take care of all that comes beside him, all that should assault him. He need not be afraid. And he would not. This was a great tradition in his family. In his family, his family was converted as early as uh, 1615. It was, in, it was in the 17th century sometime. But he was one of the oldest families in, the Viet, uh, in Vietnam to be Catholic. This means probably he was converted by Jesuits. Oh, well, no Franciscan there. <laughs> they had come from Japan. And... Um, he had a great respect, as well as if you read the, the story of his brothers, uh, a great respect for Catholic life, Catholic culture, the bringing of Catholic sense into the society. He would not back off on any of this. As he grew up, he would have learned the lives of not only Theophane Venard, but at least a hundred and... 13, but it was wraith through all of Vietnam. Vietnam is covered in blood. There is over 130,000 Catholic martyrs in Vietnam because the pagans would cleanse the country of foreign influence. And that was the Catholic missionary effort, bringing the faith to this land. And so every family that was in Vietnam that was Catholic had a brother, an uncle, a great uncle, a great grandfather, someone who had given their life for blood. And when I was with the Archbishop, when we were mixing with Vietnamese, he would ask him, who was your grandfather? Ah, yes. And then he would tell him the story. Martyrdom. He died here. She died there. Here, I give you the slides of those who are called the Tonkin martyrs. Um, these are mainly the uh, Dominican and, and um, uh, there are a couple of Franciscans, but mainly Dominican priests and uh, martyrs uh, who um, were from France and Spain um, primarily. And these were 117. Um, John Paul II uh, did elevate um, but we don't need elevation for those who die for the faith. Um, uh, and you'll see the name over and over again, Dominic. Um, I know some religious who do that. They, 
they give the name to all those that they baptize of Dominic, if they're a Dominican. And, and um, so you'll see a lot of Deman D Dominic and a few Francis's, Francis is there. So it's a good sign. But it may have been Francis Xavier. Um, and you'll see some of them are from Spain. And Charles Carnet, which is a, a great name to look up and see. Uh, Theophane Vernard was inspired by his death which was about 1835. Yes. So this was the salt of his life. These were his life stories. And as he grew up, he, his, because of his father's uh, wisdom and his grandfather's wisdom, um, his family became quite affluent in influence, influential in fact, he was chosen to uh, establish the university in Vietnam because they are good connections, good rapport with the French. And these, uh, this creation of the university disposed them to accept the entire male population in the, the Diem family to become and study as mandarins. And this also helps us to understand the mind of Archbishop No. Because their society is so different from our society, totally different in their governance. Vietnam is a uh, jungle, basically a large jung jungle. And uh, the, I'm sorry, I've gone too far, if you don't mind. I will have to pause there for a minute. The governance is, is quite different in that to govern that nation, the people go into the woods, into the jungles, and they would create their uh, villages, those who had rights in the village are those who opened the land, cut the, the weeds away, plowed the ground the first time, made it ready for crops. They had a voting right. Now, the initial opening of the ground was called a communal ground. But if you were a clever fellow, you might go off and open further grounds, and then you had a property right once the village was established, the core of the village was established. So you had the community, then you had the property, those who had uh, opened further lands. They had a right on the council. So you had the property owners, those with a vested interest, then you had the old folk who had shown wisdom. They didn't look for the young people, I wonder why. They looked for the old ones who had experience and wisdom. They were on the council. And thirdly, you had what they called the Mandarin, now, the Mandarin was essentially a connection with the emperor. The emperor laid out the criteria for becoming a Mandarin. You had to have what was equivalent to a college education. You had to have experience in diplomacy. And this is extremely important because the Mandarin of a village was something of a mayor. He didn't have freedom to make his own decisions. That was decided by the council. He participated in the council, but he didn't rule the council. The Mandarin was the vocal, was the voice. He was the voice of the people. He was the voice of the council. He could not speak in his own name. The, the Mandarin, therefore, negotiated with the emperor. If the emperor said, we need uh, X number of pounds of rice, and you didn't have it, it would be the Mandarin who would have to negotiate and say, emperor, I'm sorry, we don't have it. We'll have to arrange something else. You had to do that without ever insulting the emperor and his authority. If you didn't succeed, you died. So it was a great motive to be very clever and very politically astute. So it's very interesting because the archbishop, in all of his negotiations and all of his conversations, which I would see later on in life, always conducted himself with that quality which sometimes we know of the Orient, this face that just is absolutely plain, shows absolutely emo no emotion whatsoever. I would know he was in his Mandarin mode when that happened. I knew that he was negotiating in his mind, oh my gosh, how am I going to handle this? Because I myself, being French and Spanish and, well, South Louisiana, a little bit passionate sometimes. Very hard to hold my passions back. And I have a little Irish blood, so, hmm. Beware. Um, 
So this is part of the reason for some of the things you'll see in his life, the way that he acted, is some of the things that are uh, problematic for us to understand as Westerners, that he seemed so very calm in how he conducted himself. But he did not look for a political solution. He looked to God the Father to resolve the issue. He knew what his vocation was and he would keep it. And I saw him write letters to Archbishop Marcel of uh, Lefebvre requesting, are you going to consecrate? I need to know. He showed me the letters. I could see them. Are you going to consecrate? I not, must know I cannot go to my grave without providing the flock with the sacraments. Answer. No answer. And the very reason why he consecrated was because he received no answer. Because his first calling is to be a Catholic bishop and to provide for the flock. And so he would not fail in that vocation. And therefore, he did consecrate. My knowledge of him, when he came to us in, I think it was um, late October. See, I'm a, unfortunately, my, um, I am getting older. Um, but I, I, my exact knowledge doesn't, doesn't always serve me anymore. We had a lot going on in that year. That was the year that Bishop Lewis was consecrated bishop in August, uh, August the 24th. And it, uh, in September, we received seven minor seminarians. Seven minor seminarians entered uh, our house. And um, so our little house, which was uh, not really that big, um, now had not only the five Franciscans there, but seven more Mexicans uh, who only knew a little bit of Mex Spanish, uh, English, and we knew only a very little Spanish. So it was a very interesting environment to work in. And then the Archbishop was coming. Well, <laughs> you know, you want to give the Archbishop the best you can. And so we made preparations for him. And I believe he arrived in early October, something like October the 10th or 12th. And there was a great deal of excitement and preparation for him. The purpose for his coming was that we were afraid that there were those who were taking advantage of him. As we learned subsequently, indeed, it had happened. And what's worse, they were those who were robbing him blind um, in France. There were those who were materially ad taking advantage of his relying upon them and basically robbing him blind. Um, and this continued even in, the, in that time of uh, 16 months that he was with us, that uh, they, came, they continued to deplete his financial resources. So, personal remembrances of uh, the Archbishop. Boy, I've gone ahead one, one too many again. My responsibilities for the Archbishop was to see that all of his needs were looked after. Um, this sometimes was taken from me, and when I had other things or some other um, event came up, I would not be, it was not my exclusive responsibility. Um, but generally, one of us was always deputed to meet him in the morning, we were, he, was, he had a second floor room to help him down the stairs, to bring him across a distance from perhaps here to the hallway that leads into the chapel or to the, um, the main hallway. So it was a, is a fair distance from the house over to the uh, chapel. And this is Rochester, New York, and it's October turning winter. Ice was coming. And so we would have to guard him from slipping and falling. Um, the Archbishop was uh, a very <laughs> limber man um, for his age, very well, uh, very strong. On one occasion, I do recall, uh, to my great chagrin, um, not perhaps paying as much attention as I ought to, he slipped, he fell, and my heart fell with him. And I thought, I've killed him. <laughs> because at, you know, 82, 83 years old, you fall to the ground on ice. It could be a broken hip or leg or something in the spine. And what have you got now? You've got a, a whole series of miseries. And 
he rolled onto his back. He sat back up. He said, I said, oh, are you, are you fine? Are you all right? He said, il ne fait rien de tout, un petit peu pour le, pour le purgatoire. It doesn't matter. It's just a little bit more for purgatory. That was one of the things he would say very often. Just a little bit something more to give for purgatory. The archbishop was always on time. When we would come down to meet him, he was always seated, waiting for us, waiting for us to take him down the stairs and out. He was always ready. The archbishop, when he got into the chapel, had his breviary properly marked, ready to go. He was always ready to pray his divine office. When he was waiting for us, he would be praying the rosary, always had the rosary in his hand. He was always praying the rosary. He had a great devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And after the office, he would remain with us, attend the community mass, offer his own private mass, attend the um, meditation and the thanksgiving which we made before going back to the house and making the half hour of spiritual reading and then going down for breakfast. He kept schedule with us. Those who accuse him of being weak of mind never knew the archbishop, didn't know anything of him, and are obscuring their own judgment deliberately. The archbishop's mind was very keen. We had what we call the Latin days. One day a week in the seminary. Uh, watch out, minor seminarians, this may fall on you. One day a week, we spoke only Latin in the house. Only Latin. The archbishop would go through the house telling jokes in Latin. <laughs> pulling pranks that relied on the language. Um, asking us questions deliberately. Oh, you don't want to walk past his door. <laughs> because he would try and draw, draw, draw you out. So, it was a very quiet house on that day, except for the archbishop's voice, which would ring across the house. And it was um, very interesting, you know, whenever he received a letter, we would present the letter to him, and um, it would be dated the time of the reception, the, we received it, and, and he would open up and begin making his notes, pull out a sheet of paper, and begin writing. It might be in Vietnamese, it might be in Latin, it might be in French, it might be in German, it might be in his newly acquired Spanish. Tell me, how many of you 80-year-olds are learning Spanish? Because he was entrusted to teach to the Mexican students, he was teaching their Latin to them. So you heads, you know, you're in good company. The teaching of Latin is very important to the Archbishop. Oh, you're, you have a good uh, patron there um, in teaching Latin. He had a very active mind and a very good mind. And uh, his sense of humor was uh, uh, very gentle and very kind, but very good also. So I put this document in because we have to understand when we look at the archbishop's life, and he received permission, which every Catholic bishop basically sees, to act according to our hearts. And this is what this document shows. Archbishop Bishop, uh, Le, uh, took, received this authorization to act according to our hearts. That rings true to another line, which was the launching point for our Lord himself's life. When he would go to Cana, to the wedding feast, and found that they were short in wine, Our Lady said, they have no wine. And our Lord's response is, what is to me is to thee, woman or lady. It is my heart and your heart. We are one. We are one. Every time you read this in a papal encyclical, you ought to know that you are to keep your heart in the sacred heart. You are to be one in mind with the church, not deviating by some new construction to the left or to the right, but one. This is what the Archbishop understood, and this is the authorization which every bishop, when the circumstances arrive, every bishop in mission countries, when it is necessary to take extraordinary steps, is not afraid to take. This is the step which the Archbishop would take 
in order to provide the sacraments. I accompanied the archbishop. He had already consecrated Carmona and Zamora. He had been brought to the United States. He was in our company in Rochester, New York. And um, it was thought, you know, we ought to make the archbishop better known. He should connect. And his response always was, ah, oh, no, 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 no. I've done my work. I've done my work. This is yours now. And we would say, Your Excellency, yes, but they need to know. We need to make you at least known enough that they can understand that your mind is clear, that you're still determined, that you're not varying in your statement. So we went to Acapulco in 1983. Um, this is uh, on the photo on the, on the right. Oh, I'm sorry. The one on the right is one of the dinners that we had. And the archbishop's on the right here. That's uh, a young me on the left, um, looking a little shocked, I guess. And then uh, on the left was uh, a group of us, um, Bishop Louis Vizelis, Bishop um, uh, Carmona, then Zamora, and Bravo. Um, all three are of those Mexican bishops are dead now. Uh, in fact, all four of those bishops are dead. Um, and then on the far left is... Um, my parents. I got the picture because it was from my family album. I guess I could have cropped that. But um, they came, and it was the first time I had seen them in some long while. And uh, they were shocked to see me at the bishop's meeting. We also brought him to meet the public um, to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The photo on the left is that of him offering mass in the hotel in um, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And then uh, the dinner that followed uh, so you will notice in the picture, um, in the four, well, starting on the, on the foreground on the left is Bishop Musi, then Vita Elmer, and then I believe that is um, Father Fui, perhaps, and then on the right is Bishop McKenna, the Archbishop, and um, Bishop Louis Vizelis. That was a meeting that I didn't go to. But in our community, uh, you can see a few of us um, there. We were a packed community, so you really couldn't hide from anybody. We all got to know one another very well. And uh, in religious life, you do get to know one another well. We had common recreation, and we worked together for two or three hours every afternoon. Uh, our studies would be separate, um, and so we would be only during the morning and a little bit during the afternoon where we'd be separated but the most of the afternoon um, and evening would be spent together. So we got to know one another very well. Uh, I just showed a picture of the small complex. You can see the house in the center picture. Uh, if I had to guess the square footage, because I never really calculated, I would say maybe 5,000 square feet for all those souls inside that house. Very, very tight. The chapel is the, the small building um, here. And then it's pictured at the end of the driveway. It was a garage, an occasion, an article, which um, Father Sicada has subsequently regretted very much, uh, an article which he wrote titled, Two Bishops in Every Garage. <laughs> um, and uh, he retracted that, um, that, um, that paper. Um, but we, uh, during, my, uh, during my work at the Friary, and that was a two-car garage with a, a car and a, and a half space behind. So we converted that into a chapel um, because Franciscans are poor, and we were trying to escape that um, but live it. We were forced to live it. Um, and so when I speak to you about the archbishop, there was a great deal of suffering for him. He had been with us. Uh, over a year, his contacts with Vietnamese was very limited. He would go and eat out occasionally um, at an oriental restaurant, and we came to know a few Vietnamese uh, in the, that restaurant. They would prepare meals that were like home. And you could always see that he was very pleased to have something more familiar to him than um, our Franciscan fare. <laughs> um, but this occasioned him getting to know 
some of the Vietnamese in, the, in Rochester. And was a result, as a result, we started having rosaries um, once a week. Um, there would be a group rosary, and we would go and pray the rosary with a group of Vietnamese in private homes, and there would be a tea, and he'd have some familiar conversation. And so there were probably five or six occasions where I went with him amongst Vietnamese, brought him to these occasions, and um, pray with them the rosary in Vietnamese, which I don't know how to pray that, Father. <laughs> so, um, um, but it, as a result, news of his presence got a little bit more widespread because we hadn't made a big splash about his presence in Rochester. And one of the men who learned of him was Mr. Tron, who was owner of the Car Hotel Carter in New York, New York, and also owned a hotel in uh, Buffalo, New York. So he had occasion to drive between New York and Buffalo back and forth. It was a Hotel Roosevelt in Buffalo. Mr. Tron had, uh, was a self-made man and um, um, came to own that Hotel Carter, which was considered a welfare hotel. Uh, so basically, Catholic charities would send him clients, and he would put them up, and then they would be moved out of the hotel into some other form of housing somewhere else in the city. Um, the hotel itself was probably built in 1919, 1920 something. The rooms, the rooms would uh, be quite proper for a Franciscan. They were very small. Um, I, I went into one of the rooms. There was a twin bed with about a foot and a half on one side and two feet on the other side and about two feet on the foot. And uh, that was the bedroom. That was a bedroom that you would rent. And um, there was a bathroom down the hall. <laughs> um, some of them had bathrooms in the suite. So we were brought um, to the Vietnamese community in New York. This really begins my last period with the Archbishop. And I've never told this story because it would be a he said, she said, and I always thought, I really don't want to get into this. So I've never told the story of what happened in, in New York City publicly. I've told my confessors and bishops, but I've never spoken with it publicly. Um, Mr. Tron came and visited to us, and we got to know him once. He came a second time, and he asked on the second time once more, let the Archbishop come and spend the Chinese New Year with us in uh, New York City. And this would mean sometime in the middle of January, a few weeks after our New Year, the Chinese New Year would begin. So we figured, ah, oh, what can a weekend hurt? It would be very nice. It would be a good break. And I told Bishop Lewis, I said, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea. And he said, you are too fearful. And I said, okay, but I've made my point. I said, at least set some conditions that the archbishop is to fly because a drive for seven hours for a man who's 84 years old is going to be too much. It may take his life. Um, so at least let's find a convenient flight and get him on a plane and fly him to New York City. Um, one of us has to go with him. At least one of us has to go with him so that uh, knowing his health conditions, we can provide and make sure that he's safe. Um, because I had been in the, in the habit of taking the Archbishop every week, every other week, to see a doctor to look after a condition which was tending towards diabetes. And I monitored him, him every day, at least once a day, generally twice, to, to check how his blood sugar was doing. Because when he got too much sugar, he would just sleep all day long. And so that was, I was a bad boy. I, mean, I had to, you know, you can't have that bishop. It's hard for a, a 21, 22-year-old kid to tell an archbishop, you know, you can't have that. That was one of my jobs, and he tolerated. Um, so I said, you know, we have to do this to protect him. So he said, okay, we'll make those arrangements. So Mr. Tron agreed to this, and everything was set. We would go 
from the house. Mr. Tron came in a wonderful stretch limo. Um, we climbed into the limo, and um, I had maybe 35 minutes to pack everything the Archbishop needed for Mass and his personal things. Got into the limo and began our drive. We drove away from the monastery, and there was one possibility of going to the airport. We could take this street, or we could take the next street. We passed the first street. Boom, 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 boom. I'm thinking, you know, we could take that street. Oh, no, we're going to go down this way. We come to the second street, and instead of turning to the right onto the interstate that leads to the airport, we take a left. I'm 22 years old. I'm in a car with an archbishop. There's a driver for the limo. There's another man in the front seat. There's a son of Mr. Tron. And I tell him, Mr. Tron, sir, we're supposed to be going to the airport. It's to the right. We're going to miss our flight. And he tells me, ah, that flight um, we missed. We have to drive on to uh, Syracuse. We have to drive on. And I say, that's not what we agreed to. We agreed to fly out of Rochester. And he said, no, no, we, we'll get him there. The limo is very comfortable. He'll be just fine. And I said, sir, since we agreed to the air flight, we can return to, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. time. Oh, this is, this is going to go on. So, sir, why don't we return to the monastery? We can get a flight in the morning. I can fly him over. You can take the limo and go back to New York City, and we'll meet you. You can meet, you, meet us at the airport tomorrow morning. He said no. So I realized at that time everything was out of my hands. I insisted, if you're a man of your word, you will get us to the airport, and we will find a flight. So I it basically lay there. We drove on to Syracuse, and by that time he said, okay, we'll find a flight in Syracuse. So we stopped. It was a Friday. We took a fish meal because the only flight that was available was at 1130 at night. And it was what they called at those times, if you know anything about New York, uh, Air New York, no, Apple Air, Apple Airlines. If you know anything about airlines, this was one of those airlines that may or may not show up. And so we waited for the plane, and we waited, and we waited. An hour and a half late, it's getting to be 1 o'clock in the morning. And I told him, let's get a room, let's get a room. Don't make the archbishop stay up. Already I knew they were willing to abuse not only our trust, but the health of the archbishop, that they had no respect for him. That was very set in my mind. We got on the plane and flew to New York City. A limo caught us there, and we were brought to the, air, to the hotel. At the hotel, I put the archbishop to bed. I retired, um, and we waited for the next morning. The next morning, we had breakfast, mass, and they brought us downstairs to limos, two limos this time, one for himself. Um, I'm sorry, one limo this trip. Um, and we were put into the limo, and we drove to New York City, uh, to, uh, to uh, Washington, D.C. There was going to be a meeting of all the Vietnamese, and this community of Vietnamese uh, was famous for the martyrs, as a, as a, by the by. I think it was Assumption Parish, but they were having a celebration for the martyrs. There was a, a great event there already planned for the Chinese New Year and to celebrate the Vietnamese martyrs. Well, the archbishop said, oh, yeah, we have to go to that. Um, so I couldn't say no. I wasn't in control. We got in the car. We drove to New York City. We were, went to a hotel. From there, we drove to a Nova Sordo church and went into the church hall, and the archbishop greeted a number of people there. From this place, we went to a Vietnamese doctor immediately after. And the Vietnamese doctor said, oh, I tested his blood sugar. 
He has no blood sugar difficulties whatsoever. He is completely fine. He can eat anything that he wants. And I said, Doctor, I have been with the Archbishop for over a year and a half. He has been under the care of a medical doctor. I know the doctor. I have been watching his blood sugar all this time. I know what goes up and what goes down. He says, I am a doctor. I work for the World Health Organization. Who are you? Again, anger. And what is it? Ad hominem argument. And therefore, I could do nothing. The Archbishop was being plied the whole while with candy, with candy, 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 candy. They were feeding him anything that he craved, anything he wanted, and he would enjoy it for a time. I knew that. Everybody enjoys to have break training for a little bit, right? But I don't think he understood what, where this road was going down. I admonished him. I showed him the test strips because I continued to test him, what was happening to him. And um, that night, there was a supper. And then the next day, we had morning mass at the hotel, and we returned to New York City. I called Rochester, and I informed him all that I was transpiring, that um, I didn't like what was transpiring, that I was observing the archbishop's health, the, the doctor. I gave him a complete report. And I said, we've got to get him out of there. Mr. Tron said, oh, there's a wonderful occasion. Next week, there's going to be a special celebration for the Archbishop. I've arranged it all. So we were going to end up spending. Now, this happened. Um, I said, the Archbishop is very tired. We probably shouldn't travel with him today, but tomorrow morning, we need to get him on a plane, get him home, or you need to come and pick him up. We need to take control of this situation. We remained in New York City Monday, Tuesday. Bishop Lewis softened on Wednesday or Thursday. I don't remember which day it was. And he said, ah, well, it'll be all right. I've talked to the Archbishop. He still has good control of his mind. It'll be all right. So off to New York we go again, uh, to Washington and we go once more. We go back to the same hotel, and when we get to the hotel, we're greeted by a Vietnamese bishop, and I'm unaware of all of this, a Vietnamese bishop, a Vietnamese priest, um, who, and a second Vietnamese priest who knew the archbishop as he had been his valet at one time. I don't remember if he was in Vietnam or while he, he was in Rome. These were men who he had, archbishop had either himself elevated to bishopric, to make them bishops, but they were all Novus Ordo. And they were stationed at um, Conception, um, oh boy, in Missouri. Carthage, Missouri, I think it's called Conception, um, Immaculate Conception uh, Seminary, which is now the Vietnamese home base for a community, a religious community. And um, I was a little befuddled at that. What are, they, what are they doing here? Why are they here? Oh, we're going to the apostolic delegate's office. And I said, does the archbishop know this? Oh, he's okay with it, I was told. And I said, Your Excellency, do you really want to go see the uh, apostolic delegate? And he said, ah, oh, it'll be all right. By this time, he knew he was out of control. And he was going to be politically careful, guarded. We departed the hotel and arrived there. Uh, it was in the morning, for sure, because we would take lunch afterwards. Can't remember the exact hour, but it was fairly early. We entered the apostolic delegate's office. And this is the building. And as you go into the front door there, immediately to the right, we were greeted by a secretary to the apostolic delegate. We entered the first room, which would be the window immediately to the right of the entrance door. And um, in a nervous way, I just began preparing the archbishop, you know, 
straightening his clothes, talking to him a little bit. And uh, once he was all set, I would, um, they began staying close to, very close to him and um, trying to keep me away from him a bit. Um, we waited for a while for the Archbishop, for the Apostolic Delegate, who at that time was Pio Laghi. And we went through that entrance. There was a, you would enter into the building, and then immediately to the right was uh, one parlor, and further through was a, another entrance into a second parlor, which composed the corner and ran down the opposite, the far end, down the length of the building. We were led into that second parlor, and there the, the apostolic delegate greeted us. Um, the archbishop sat at the end of a couch, a sofa. The apostolic delegate sat in the middle of the couch, and um, Mr. Tron sat on his right. Uh, there was a bishop, and he sat in an armchair to the left of the archbishop. And I stood behind the lamp off to the side because I thought, I, I don't want to be afar from the archbishop. I want him to see me. I want to be close to the archbishop. But I couldn't interpose very easily. The conversation began. Many pleasantries, remembrances of one another, meeting on previous occasions. And eventually, um, they put before the archbishop a piece of paper it's, it said, would you like to return? You may return. Why don't you sign this piece of paper? And the archbishop said, I don't think so. And uh, they went on with a couple of other conversations. And we had been in the room perhaps 40 minutes. And I said, Your Excellency, in a, a slight lull, I said, Your Excellency, are you tired? Would you like to go? And he said, Yes, we. Oui. And I said, It's the time for the Archbishop's normal nap. Please, would you excuse us? And at that moment, the Apostolic Delegate, and I reached down to, to give my hand to the Archbishop, because I had moved around the lamp stand, and I was put my hand out for the Archbishop. And he reached up to me, and the apostolic delegate took his left arm, put it across the lap of Archbishop No, and pulled him down and said, if you're not going to be a gentleman, you had better leave the room. And I said, the archbishop is tired. This is the normal time for him to have a rest. It has been a long day already. We have traveled. Please, may he go. And the, the uh, apostolic delegate repeated himself. I think you had better go if you're not acting like, since you're not acting like a gentleman. Well, um, I, by this time, being only um, turning 23, 21 years old, uh, was pretty much this way, not knowing what to do or say next. And so I took myself out of the room. I said, Your Excellency, would you like to leave the room? And he, he, he didn't say anything. Silence. No reaction, because he knew there was nothing that could be done. Um, I departed the room and, in a consternation, paced, paced, paced. And I realized, here I am at the Apostolic Delegate Delegation. Nobody knows I'm here. Nobody, no friends of mine are able to come to my assistance. All I can do is call upon the saints and angels. And I said, what am I supposed to do? And then that's when I realized, you are supposed to do something. And so at that moment, I was told, go find a phone. Tell someone where you are. Get some word of wisdom from somebody. So I searched the hall. It was a wide hall. There was a stairway that went to the second floor. I went down the hall, and I found the secretary's office after maybe a 10-minute search. Knocked on the door. Nobody was present. Uh, opened the door, and there was a phone. Eureka! 
I went to the phone and picked it up and nothing. I found a button, hit it, and ah, yes, a dial tone. Deo gracias. I made my call and I called Bishop Louis Vazelis and I told him what had transpired, where we were, and I said, what am I to do? And he said, get back in the room. <laughs> Make sure he doesn't sign anything. And I said, how can I stop if he wanted to? I can't control anything. He said, try and get back in and just witness what's going on. They did not let me back in the room. Uh, the apostolic delegates uh, secretary showed up as I left this telephone. And um, he kept me in the first parlor that I described to you. And we sat and talked. And I talked to him theology. And uh, a, a dear priest friend of mine said, Oh, Father, he was looking for a doctorate. He was writing his doctorate. So don't you realize someone writing a doctorate is a slave? He can't have an opinion. <laughs> he, will sell, he would say nothing to you. And he didn't. I laid out the whole case for state of econtism as best I could at that age. He had no answers whatsoever. The archbishop, after maybe another 10 or 15 minutes, came out of the room uh, being held by the apostolic delegate. The apostolic delegate had him in such a way that he was controlling the, the archbishop's arm. And I walked up to him and followed beside him and he said, began making their, their, uh, their departures, uh, saying their adios, their, their, uh, making their departures. And they said, let's go into the chapel and pray and sing a hymn to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And again, my heart just sank. I don't know how I could go into a, a Novus Ordo church or a chapel and pray to the Virgin Mother. And I said, oh, Mother, help me, but I have to stay with the Archbishop. I walked in and we sang a hymn to the Virgin Mother walked out, said our, our goodbyes in the entrance hall, stepped out of the apostolic delegate's office, at which point they attempted to keep me separated from the archbishop. I said, absolutely no. I will ride with the archbishop. There's no way you're separating me. So we got into the two limos at this point. Um, Mr. Tron and his family were in the second limo. Uh, the bishop, archbishop, the bishop, and the priest, and myself, the two priests and myself, were in the uh, first limo. Mr. Tron's son was in the front seat. And we made, began making our departure. And I asked, I said in the limo when we got in, because I was still in a rage, I said, How long have you planned this? And the bishop said, we have planned this a very, very long time. We want the archbishop. We went from here to take lunch. We went to a place that was called the Golden Lion, which is, um, if my memory serves me correctly, it no longer exists because I tried to look it up. Um, it is located across from the Watergate building, and I thought, ooh, how apropos. <laughs> <laughs> um, we went into this French haute cuisine uh, restaurant and I sat beside the Archbishop and we ate. I had no appetite. Um, the Archbishop wanted to go into the men's room and they kept two men beside us the whole time. We were not permitted any privacy whatsoever. I realized at that time I was a prisoner. There was no leaving me alone. We went to the hotel, and at the hotel, went up with the archbishop. They kept a man at the door. We prepared uh, for supper, because this was the evening where it was supposed to be a public event, and um, went into, a, um, I don't remember, it was across the river, but I don't know which city it was. Could have been Vienna or Arlington. But the place was called uh, Martha Washington's um, convention or party house, or something like that. It was a, it was a room about the size of this room, and there were the room was filled 
Um, maybe it was a little larger than this because there was a larger crowd. And the Archbishop obviously knew a great number of these. these this was the diplomatic, car, uh, the diplomatic corps and the uh, elites of Vietnam. And they were there to honor the Archbishop, I was told. And um, he was sat at, on the dais at the front. I was placed uh, to the back at a table with um, a few souls that I didn't know. And um, we ate and um, made our departure after perhaps two and a half hours. Um, got back to the hotel. And as we entered into the hotel room with someone watching at the door, um, the Archbishop looked at me and he said, we have got to get out of here now. And I looked at him and I said, Your Excellency, there's someone watching us at the door. How can we do this? And within a few minutes of entering the room, I was incapacitated. I could not stand. I could only crawl. The, the room was spinning around. Um, I don't, I, th I think I was poisoned because I've looked into various uh, ways. And you have to remember, I'm dealing with people who had fought a war in Vietnam. These are people who were in the intelligentsia. They were used to knocking people off. They were used to all kinds of nefarious actions. I was incapacitated for hours. I could do nothing. And he said, no, these are wicked people. These are evil people. We have got to leave here now. And I said, Your Excellency, we can't do it. I can't even walk. Um, I said, let's, let's at least try and get some sleep and see if we can do something in the morning. And so we said our prayers and prepared and retired and set the alarm to get up in the morning. We got up and there was someone watching at the two ends of the hall. And so I realized there was no way for us to get out. So I returned to the room. We went back to New York City, and I was never left alone with the Archbishop from that time forward. In fact, the Vietnamese clergy came in to the suite that had been given to us. It was a one room with uh, two bedrooms. There was a bedroom here, a slight hallway, a bathroom, and a second ba bedroom. I had the second bedroom. He had the larger bedroom. And then there was a parlor with sofas. They always kept someone in that parlor. We could not leave the hotel room without going through this man. And so uh, when we returned the next morning, we had mass. Some of the family came and the archbishop said, j'ai fatigue. I must go back to bed. I'm tired. He did not get up out of that bed except to go to the restroom. He ate whatever they wanted. They kept feeding him poison. We, I could not get him out of the bed. There was one interval where um, they made a departure, and I said, Your Excellency, we have got to get out of here now. This is our chance. So I had been thinking in my mind, how can I do this? I've got a 90, at this time point, he's 95 years old, 95-year-old man who shuffles in his walk. I cannot take him down 24 floors on an elevator. I can't do it. Uh, I can't take him down 24 floors in the stairway. So I, I said, okay, this is what I'll do. I'll get him onto the elevator. I'll take him down to the second or third floor. We'll walk the last three floors, and we're going to go out the escape. So I went to the elevator, went down the, the floors, and I came out on, a, I think, the third or the fourth floor um, because I had gotten familiar enough with the building to know which floor. I chose that floor. I went to the escape. I got out onto the street with the archbishop, and we began walking down the street, and he said, j'ai fatigue. He couldn't go any further. And I thought, we've got to get at least half a block away before I call a cab. 
There were no cabs close by. There was nothing close by. So I thought, okay, we'll try and get into a restaurant. We'll slip into a restaurant. And maybe he can sit for a few minutes, get a cup of tea or something, and maybe we can try again. We slept in, slipped into the restaurant, and we had ordered the cup of coffee, and immediately the guards showed up. And from that time forward, I was no longer permitted in his room. The, um, uh, Mr. Tron had given me $100, he said, in case you need it. And I had thought, okay, that $100 is going to get me out of here. <laughs> they took the $100. And so now I was separated from the Archbishop. I was on the 24th story of the Hotel Carter in New York City. I could not call out because every phone call that I attempted was cut off. And I was alone. So I resolved, I will leave the hotel. I will go out and I'll find someone who can come in and change the situation. So I tried once more to call. Um, should, should, do we need to stop? <laughs> By this time, I had stopped eating the food that they served me because I didn't trust the food. I ate only things that were packaged or things that, were, that I, I could see through, that I didn't smell funny or anything. And I was getting sick. And so um, I stayed with the Archbishop as much as I can and tried to stay. They didn't permit me to stay in the room with him. Therefore, I stayed in the little parlor room and sat there and tried to go in and see him as often as I could to let him know that I was there. Um, this persisted from Monday till about Thursday, by which time I had been eating almost nothing. Bishop Lewis showed up on Wednesday, and he made absolutely no progress in trying to get Mr. Tron, because Mr. Tron said, oh no, there's another event this weekend. It's going to be fine. We'll return him to Rochester. Don't worry. Right, like I'm going to believe you. So, um, I told Bishop Lewis, who was finally believing me, um, that there, there's nothing we can do. I, I can't see a way out. And there are those who suggested, and there's a website that has it, uh, that we were going to get the Vietnamese, the, uh, the Korean mafia involved, we were going to get the mafia involved and get in there and do a raid on the building and take him physically by force. We called the police to try and declare that perhaps this was a kidnapping. But when the police came to see the archbishop, um, he was told, uh, they said, well, do you want to stay here, bishop? And his answer was, j'ai fatigue, je reste ici. I am tired, I cannot move, I'm, I must stay here. And that was his real answer. And that is how I last saw him. The Archbishop never was permitted to see another traditional Catholic. Never. No one who ever attempted to see him ever was permitted to see him again. They say that he was reconciled to the church. I don't believe it, because he had told me many times, I will not deny that work which God gave and put before me. This is a man who knew that his father, in his fidelity, his father had given his life he was buried by Ho Chi Minh in 1942, I think, or 43, because his father refused to abandon his faith and serve Ho Chi Minh. He would not deny his emperor. He would not serve Ho Chi Minh. He was buried alive with Archbishop No's oldest brother. Those two men, Archbishop knew, no, knew how to offer himself, knew how that he could not abandon his position. There are claims that he signed a reconciliation that even had on a website at one point him sitting there with a jo very joyful face and a piece of paper, and it looked like he was signing it. They have never produced this piece of paper, which I challenged them to produce. Never have produced it. Nothing could convince me that he did this until they present this piece of paper. So in my personal experience of the archbishop, this was a man who had learned the lesson that we love our faith with all of our mind, with all of our heart, with all of our strength. We love him as our Lord and our God. We go to the Father and we follow after the Father. 
We offer ourselves as Christ to the Father. And no matter what comes upon us in our life, we do not vary from that purpose which God has given to us as shepherds, as priests, as parents, as grandparents. You remember your mission and you keep it. And it may be that things will get out of your control, but you keep that mission, that vocation, which God has given to you. In my mind, that is the life of Archbishop No, and that is the story of his life, and that is the inspiration. And I thank you very much for listening. I ask your prayers for Archbishop No and for all of his clergy.